church. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, I want to share a Christmas message with you this morning entitled, A Tale of Two Kings. A Tale of Two Kings. I want you to know this morning that Christmas is about the birth of a king. When Jesus came, he came into this world to establish his kingdom. Now, one of the things I like about the Bible, and if you read uh, the Bible very closely and, and study the life of Jesus, one of the things you'll realize very quickly is there's four books about Jesus' life. There's four Gospels. And each one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each have just a little different angle about what they emphasize about Jesus. Now, there's a lot of overlap uh, between the books about what he said and some of the things he did. But if you study them closely, you'll notice that there's just a little bit different angle. It's kind of like, you know, when we have a, a, a birthday party or an event of some sort, you go on a trip, and everybody these days has, a, has a, a, a camera on their phone in their pocket, and everybody takes their picture, and you just get a little different angle from everybody's picture, and you see the event a lot better with a bunch of different pictures, different camera angles. Well, that's a lot what the Gospels are like. They're different camera angles of the same story, but you get a complete picture when you look at them together. And what's interesting about the birth of Jesus is uh, all four Gospels emphasize a little different part of it. Now, what's interesting about the Gospel of Mark is Mark does not talk about the birth of Jesus. Mark starts with the ministry of Jesus. And it's interesting because the main word, the key word in the book of Mark is uh, the Greek word uthos, which means immediately. You ever notice if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's 16 chapters, it's the shortest book. But every time you turn around, Jesus is immediately doing this. He's immediately doing that. He's immediately doing this. He's a man of action. It's all about teaching, ministry, just gets right to the point. Not a lot about who he is as much as what he did and what he said. You get with the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John has a prologue that starts out, and it places the life and ministry of Jesus in the context of creation. John 1.1 1, 1 starts just like Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And then John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so for John, it starts the whole story of Jesus with making sure that you understand that when Jesus came into this world, listen, it's the light that entered darkness, but He is the Word that became flesh. That little baby was the creator of the universe who took on the weakness of one of his own creations. That's the story of the gospel, one emphasis of the gospel of John. Well, the gospel of Luke is interesting because Luke seems to be written mainly to a Gentile audience. It's written to Romans and, and, and Greek people and, and trying to help them understand that this Jesus that was born in this remote part of the Roman Empire over in Israel uh, was kind of the backwaters, Bethlehem, that he is the Savior of the world. And one of the things that's interesting about Luke's story is he adds a genealogy and he has a birth story. And all of Luke's uh, angels and all of Luke's story focuses on Mary. And the reason it focuses on Mary is because it goes back through Mary's genealogy and shows how that Mary's uh, ancestors were descendants of David according to the flesh. Mary, the mother, physical mother of Jesus, physically descended from David, not through the kingly line, but through another line, but to show that, that, David, uh, that Mary uh, was the descendant of David through the flesh, and Jesus is physically a descendant of David. But then that genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Because you know what Luke's trying to help us understand? He's trying to help us understand that if you go back far enough, guess what? We're all related. Amen? There's only one race, the human race. And Jesus came to save all of us. And uh, he, he came to save the world. So Jesus is the Savior of the world, of all people, in the book of Luke. Well, Matthew's interesting because Matthew puts the focus on Joseph. You see, Jesus was the physical child of Mary, but he was born of a virgin, as we all know. And he was the legal son of Joseph. And so the book of, of Matthew is written to Jewish people primarily, a Jewish audience, and it's trying to show us that Jesus is the king of Israel. And it does that by putting the spotlight on Joseph and tracing his genealogy. Matthew and Luke both have genealogies. And Matthew's genealogy goes back to Abraham. It doesn't go all the way to Adam. You know why? Because the story of Israel starts with Abraham. And he's trying to show that all the promises and all the faithfulness of God to Israel is bound up in Jesus being the king of Israel. So it starts with Abraham goes to David 
And then it traces how that David's sons, all the sons of David that were kings of, of Judah, and all the kings, it's the kingly line, and shows how that David, that Joseph, as Jesus' legal dad, that that makes Jesus a legal descendant of David through the kings, through the kingly line. And so Jesus is a legal descendant of David as a king. He's a physical descendant of, 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 of Mary, of David through Mary. But here's what Joseph is putting the emphasis on, or Matthew rather, is that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And so you see then that he's the king of Israel. You see then that an angel appears to Joseph, and just like in Luke, he prepares Mary for the birth of Jesus. You know what? He prepares Joseph. How many of you know that both of them needed some help, right? Both of them needed some, some supernatural help in understanding what was going on. Mary, for what was happening to her, and Joseph, for what was happening to Mary. And so an angel appeared and prepared him. But then what really, what really is more of a focus of Matthew than even the birth of Jesus. He doesn't spend a lot of time on the birth of Jesus like Luke does. He, he, in chapter 2, he really starts painting the picture of how the birth of Jesus sets up a conflict. And it sets up a conflict with another king. And for Matthew, Christmas is really about a tale of two kings. There's King Jesus who's been born into the world and immediately, just based on his entrance into this world, he's in conflict with a king, an earthly king named Herod. And so I want us to read this famous uh, passage, Matthew chapter 2, about how Matthew, how Matthew is putting the spotlight on Herod's reaction, on Herod, King Herod's reaction to Jesus being born. Notice what it says, Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Now let me just point out a couple of things real quickly as we get started. Now notice that this is not... Uh, not it's after Jesus was born. All right, a lot of times you know we see in pageants and we see uh, in movies and things like that uh, the the kings coming uh, and and giving their gifts to a a newborn baby Jesus in a manger. And you know what? I'm not I'm not one of those that fusses about a lot of that stuff. You know I, I'm I you know I don't know why people get all put out about Santa Claus. We like Santa Claus at our house. We think it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know and 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 you get some uh, some different traditions and stuff like that. But biblically, just so you know the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is, is that the Magi didn't come, the wise men didn't come to see Jesus in the manger. This is after he's been born. Some, a lot of scholars believe that Jesus was anywhere between, you know, uh, six months to two years old. And we'll see why in just a minute. Uh, but he is not a baby, uh, or a newborn baby. He's a child. He's a, 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 a young, uh, a very young uh, uh, boy, very young Baby, but not necessarily an infant at this point. And also notice, you know, these magi, these wise men, are coming from the east. More, more than likely, they were coming from Babylon, Persia, that area. And you say, well, how did they even know about Jesus? How would they even expect um, a Savior, a Messiah? How would they even be looking for that? Well, you'll remember that Israel was deported. Israel was taken captive and went into captivity to Babylon. You remember the story of Daniel? Daniel's in in Babylon over there and and and, uh, and with the Persians and all that. So they heard the prophecies of, of, of the prophets. They heard Daniel. They knew about all that. As a matter of fact, there was still a very large Jewish community in Babylon at the time of Jesus. That community has existed there up until the modern day. Uh, matter of fact, if you know anything about Judaism, you'll uh, remember that, uh, that one of their major bodies of literature, one of the major uh, bodies of literature that defines Judaism is called the Babylonian Talmud. And so there's a lot of, they knew a lot about what the Scripture said. They knew a lot about the Old Testament. And these magi, these wise men, had known about those Scriptures and they knew that there was uh, something happening. They see this uh, star. Notice what happens in verse 2. Uh, they ask, they say, where is he? They're talking to Herod the king. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now look at Herod's reaction. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now let me just tell you, uh, we're going to find out, you're going to find out this morning that when Jerusalem, or Herod was one of those guys 
that when he was upset, everybody was upset. You ever heard the phrase, when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? Well, listen, when Herod wasn't happy, wasn't nobody happy, all right? And so when Herod's upset, all of Jerusalem's upset with him because he, he had quite the temper and <laughs> kept everybody on edge. And notice what happens. He does something about it. He's a man of action. Now, he's sick at this time. He's about to die probably in about two years. This is probably, Jesus was born, you know, uh, Jesus wasn't born in zero. <laughs> you know, he wasn't born in one day. He was actually born about 6 B.C. Uh, we're off about six years on the birth of Jesus. There's a guy named Dionysius Exegus who was a 6th century monk. He's the guy that first uh, first came up with what we uh, our year system in the in, in the calendar about the sixth century A.D. and he he didn't know about when Herod died. All right, so uh, so we know that Herod died about four B.C. and uh, based on all we know about Jesus and, and this time period, uh, most scholars believe Jesus was born five to six B.C. and so he is is taking care of business here. Look, he's very concerned. Notice what happens in verse four: gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And they quote the prophet Micah, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And he says, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, what's interesting is, is that these guys stop the quote there. If you go read Micah 5, 2, they left out the last part of it, which says his goings forth have been from eternity, right? And so even Micah understood that this baby coming into the world wasn't just any normal baby, that he's a baby that existed from all eternity. And so, but they didn't quote that part to Herod. And then notice what happens. Uh, Herod starts plotting. You're going to see in a minute that Herod was a major political plotter. And even on his deathbed here, even as he's sick, he's still plotting. Notice what happens verse 7. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And so they did the math. They're trying to figure out, you know, how old is this kid? This kid? What are we looking for here, you know? And so look at verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said... Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I may too may come and worship him. Now let me just tell you, that was not Herod's plan. He had no intention to worship Jesus. You're going to see in a minute, he's, he's plotting. He's not, he's not going to, he, 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 he smells an overthrow. And, and he doesn't tolerate that very well at all. And so look at verse 9. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Now, let me point out two things here. Uh, notice that he's referred to as the child uh, a couple times already in the text. Uh, the Greek word child does not mean infant. There's another word for infant. This means a, a, a little bit older little boy, all right? So uh, that's one reason we believe Jesus was a little older at this point. Uh, but also notice... Uh, that the star is showing them the difference between them being in Jerusalem and where Jesus is located in Bethlehem. Now, you need to know that Bethlehem is just about 30 miles from Jerusalem. You know that a star in the sky can't show you the distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, right? You know, a lot of people spend a lot of time, you may have seen National Geographic specials or some special on Netflix or something like that, where people are trying to figure out through astronomy what the star might have been that they saw, you know, the planets lined up and all that kind of stuff. All that's interesting and fascinating. I encourage you to watch it and learn from it. But here's what I want to tell you. I don't believe at all for a skinny minute that the star was an actual star in the, like out that you saw. This is a supernatural event, okay? This is a supernatural light. They perceive it as a star, and, uh, and it's leading them. But you know what? It might have been an angel. I don't know. Maybe a little angel had kind of half bright light going on out there. And, 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 but it led them to a place. And so uh, it was in our atmosphere is what I'm trying to say, okay? And so this is clearly a supernatural event, and that's what the text is claiming. Now, you can believe that or not, but that's what the text is saying happened, all right? I believe it. I mean, you know, if I, if I believe in a God that says, let there be light and turns on every star in the universe, I think he can do whatever he wants to with a light moving in this world to guide people to where he wants them to be. Amen? I don't have a problem with it at all. And then notice what happens in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly 
with great joy. Now that is a, a verse that you hear talked about. And look, everybody is rejoicing exceedingly with great joy. Amen. At the birth of Jesus. It's a time of great joy. And then notice 11. After coming into the house. Notice it's not a manger. This is a very different word. The text is very clear. This is, they, they are not in the temporary lodging that the shepherds came to. The shepherds in Luke came to the manger. They, they found the Jesus lying in the manger. At this point, they've moved into a house. All right? And so this is a different time. This isn't the day of the birth of Jesus. And uh, after coming into the house, now I'm not telling you that to get you to go throw your manger scenes away. Okay, It's all right. Chill out. <laughs> it's a, it, it can, I just want you to know what the Bible really says. All right. Uh, so don't be mad at anybody. It's all right. Now look, here's what happened. They come into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And of course, those gifts represent royalty, and, uh, and that's what they're saying. They're saying, you are the king. And then notice what happens in verse 12, though. We see what Herod is really up to. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. That's a quote from Hosea 11 verse 1. Then verse 16, When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged. And it doesn't just say angry. It says very enraged. You know what? Fits, as you're going to see in just a minute, fits Herod's character to a T. This, this, is, this is right in line with what we know about Herod. He became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which it had, that he had determined from the Magi. That's why we think that Jesus was somewhere between, you know, six months or so probably uh, to, to up to two uh, when all this happened. And so then uh, what he had spoken through Jeremiah, what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled and this is Jeremiah 31, verse 15. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because there were no more. But when Herod died, verse 19, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Now, Archelaus didn't reign long. They, Rome removed him because he, was, uh, he, he started out on a real bad foot. And that's why uh, Pilate and Roman uh, governors are in place by the time Jesus comes. But then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, that's the birth story. But what Matthew's really doing, let me tell you what, what's, what's going on. The rest of the book of, of Matthew is about the establishing of the kingdom. It's about Jesus as king. And so chapter 3, that's the end of chapter three, 2. Jesus is still a little boy. They've come back from Egypt. He's, he's had this encounter with Herod the king. And in chapter 3, you know what this is about? Third, roughly 30 years later, and John the Baptist has started his ministry. And I want you to hear what was the message of John the Baptist's ministry. What was John the Baptist saying to Israel to prepare them for the ministry of Jesus? Listen to this. It's very, very important. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent for the what? Kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message of Matthew is when Jesus was born, the king came into this world and he's establishing his kingdom. It's a tale of two kings. It's the tale of a king named Herod the Great in all of his wisdom, all of his wealth, 
all of His power and how that kingdom is in conflict with the kingdom of baby Jesus. All right. So let me just give you three very quick observations about those two kings and those two kingdoms this morning. I want to help you flesh out a little bit about who Jesus really is. Here's the first observation I want to make. The foolishness of Jesus. Now listen to this. The foolishness of Jesus is wiser than the wisdom of Herod. <laughs> the foolishness of Jesus is wiser than the wisdom of Herod. Now, Herod's kingdom was established on political cunning. That dude was a, a cunning fellow. You'll remember that later on his son, it ran in his family. His dad, Antipater, uh, was a cunning guy. He was cunning. He was, and his son, uh, Antipas. You know Herod Antipas because Herod Antipas is the one that beheaded John the Baptist later on. He's the one that Jesus stood before in trial. Do you remember how that Jesus called Herod Antipas the fox? He called him the fox because he was just like his daddy. He was always plotting. He plotted to steal his brother Philip's wife. You know, he was plotting against John the Baptist. And so it just ran in the family. But Herod was who he was. It started with his dad, Herod's dad's antipowder. Now here's the thing you need to know about this whole family. They were outsiders in Israel. They were Idumeans. Now, you, you remember that, the, that there's a northern kingdom of Judah, uh, uh, of, of Israel rather, and Galilee is really what it is in the New Testament. And then you've got Judea, which is the area around Jerusalem, that kingdom of Judea. And then you had a, a kingdom south of that at that time called Idumea. Now, the Idumeans were the descendants of the Edomites. Do you remember the Edomites from the Old Testament? They were, the, they were Esau's people. Esau was the father of the Edomites. And so Herod and all of his family were descendants of Esau. Now, how do you think that went over as them being the king over Israel when all the Jews said, hey, guess what? We've got a descendant of Esau <laughs> as our king. They didn't like that very much. Can you just imagine that? They didn't like that at all. And so they, uh, they rejected them. But here's the thing. They, these guys absolutely were masters. Antipater, Herod, all these guys were cunning because they were able to negotiate all the internal politics of Israel and all the external politics of Rome. And so here's what was going on. In Israel, the Hasmoneans were in charge. That was the people that, that, uh, that, that had liberated Israel from the uh, Syrian government before Rome came on the scene. And they had had several generations of kings, uh, priest kings on the throne in, in, in charge. And on the outside though, in Rome, what was going on was you had uh, Julius Caesar that was, uh, that was turning uh, Rome from a, uh, from a republic to an empire. You had a civil war after him between Mark Antony and Octavius. All that's going on during this time. And these guys are absolutely managing this stuff to a T. I mean, it's amazing what they were able to negotiate. And so Antipater gets them, in, gets them on the map because he helped Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a war in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, and Antipater came with the troops at the right time and helped him win that war. And because of that, Antipater was made a Roman citizen. The Jews were all given uh, some, some tax uh, breaks. <laughs> you know, aren't you glad for a tax break? They were all given tax breaks. That was a big deal in that day. Those tax breaks were just as big a deal as they are now. They were given tax breaks, and they were given freedoms in their synagogues uh, that a lot of other people didn't enjoy under Roman rule. And so because he helped Julius Caesar, he was made to be a governor over uh, a lot of Israel. Well, Harry came on the scene, and he played it too. Now, you remember Julius Caesar was assassinated, and you had these three guys. Two of them were named Mark Antony and Octavius. And they helped try to rule Rome for a little while until they had a civil war. Well, here's the thing. Herod was a big supporter of Mark Antony. You remember the story of Mark Antony and Cleopatra? Maybe you've seen the movie. Well, you know, uh, Cleopatra was cunning. Cleopatra seduced everybody and got her way. Guess who the arch nemesis were in that whole deal? It was Cle Cleopatra and Herod the Great hated each other. And Cleopatra got Mark Antony to give her Jericho at one point, and Herod hated that. Herod was always trying to get Mark Antony to keep Cleopatra off his back, all this kind of stuff. And it, totally manipulation, all this stuff. Well, here's the thing. Cleopatra lost the day. Mark Antony lost the day because at the Battle of Actium in 31 B.C., 
uh, Octavius defeats Mark Antony. Well, here's the thing. Herod was all in with Mark Antony. And you know how it goes. If you lose the war and you're on the wrong side, what usually happens? Right? <laughs> and you get a new ruler. Well, here's, what, here's, how, here's how cunning Herod was. Herod the Great goes to Octavius, who's about to become Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, and he goes crown in hand. You ever heard the phrase, hat in hand? This was crown in hand. He, he could have gone in and, 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 and visited with Octavius with his crown on his head because he was the ruler of, of, of Israel, but he didn't. He went in holding the crown, put it down on his desk and said, you know what, I know that I supported Mark Antony. I can't hide that. There's no secret to it. I supported Mark Antony. But here's what I want you to know. He said, listen, if you let me continue to be the king, I will support you with as much loyalty as I supported Mark Antony. You know what Octavius said? Deal. <laughs> he said, you know what? i tell you what, Herod, I'll give you more land. I'm going to give you more land. I'm going to give you some more troops. You go back and you're my man. And so he secured. He even, you know, he, he was on the right place at the right time. Very cunning and, uh, and absolutely. Now, that's how he handled Rome. Internally, though, the Jews didn't like him. Jewish people, he was an outsider. So you know what he did? You know what he did to secure his, 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 his rule over the Jews? He married one of the Hasmonean princesses. He married in the family. And so he married Miriam, who was, who was a beautiful Hasmonean princess. He married her, and that kind of secured his, his place there in Israel. But he was always plotting. It was politics this, politics that. He even plotted uh, uh, up to his death which one of his sons would, would, be on the, would, would inherit the kingdom. He had six different wills. I mean, it was always something going on to try to stay in power. And so Herod was cunning. He was wise. But now listen, Jesus didn't do any of that at all. What did Jesus do? Jesus came into the world and he lived a very simple life. He taught us that we ought to love each other. He taught us that we ought not to build our own kingdoms. We ought to live not for ourselves. We ought to live for God. And what did, what did Jesus do? He obeyed the Lord. He said, I come to do your will, O God. Right? How many of you know that a lot of people think that obeying God is foolishness? Let me tell you something. Jesus taught, this was Jesus' wisdom. He said this, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Think about, what, about how different this is than Herod. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Look, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's the wisdom of Jesus. Now, Herod would have rejected that on, uh, on every level. What do you mean, deny yourself? Listen, I'm going to make sure I got everything I want. What do you mean, take up a cross? I'm not going to a cross. I'll send all my enemies to a cross. That's what I'll do. It's a completely different Wisdom, is it not? Herod has earthly wisdom. Jesus has heavenly wisdom. Notice what Jesus says, verse 25. This is the wisdom of Jesus, and this is what condemns Herod. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And then he asks this question that Herod's still struggling to answer. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, the life of Jesus might have looked like a failure compared to the life of Herod. Jesus didn't build anything. He didn't win any political battles, you know. But when Jesus, in the, in the foolishness of the cross, laid down his life, you know what he did? He secured salvation for the rest of mankind. So the foolishness of Jesus is wiser than the wisdom of Herod. Not only that, but the poverty. Now look at this. The poverty of Jesus is richer than the wealth of Herod. The poverty of Jesus is richer than the wealth of Herod. Now, most of you know about Herod. You know about him killing the babies because of him being in the Gospels. But one of the things the ancient world knew about Herod more than anything was how rich he was. He was probably the wealthiest man, one of the wealthiest man's men in the Roman world. One of the reasons Octavius told him he could be governor is because of the amount of money that, that, uh, that Herod was able to give him. You know, And he was known in the ancient world as a great builder. He had a lot of money and he loved to show it off by building amazing things. He demonstrated his wealth most famously because he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. You remember how at the end of the Old Testament the temple is not near what it was in, the, in Solomon's day and it's kind of a half-built temple? Well, Solomon or uh, Herod comes along and completely renovates it, makes it amazing, 
and beautiful. And I mean, everybody, it was a wonder of the ancient world. As a matter of fact, the rabbis didn't like him very much because he wasn't Jewish and because he did a lot of things uh, against them. But even the rabbis said, if you've never seen uh, the, the temple, Herod's temple, the temple of Jerusalem, uh, you've never seen a beautiful building. It was spectacular. And he rebuilt that temple and, 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 and showed off the wealth there. He also built a couple of palaces that were amazing. He built Masada. You may uh, have heard of Masada. There's a great movie uh, about Masada. Masada was a place where the last Jewish refugees, when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., took their last stand. It is a mountain out in the middle of the desert right by the Dead Sea. And it, it just comes straight up out of that desert. It's all flat except for Masada coming straight up and then it's flat. It literally looks like an aircraft carrier out in the middle of the desert. And Herod built on top of that, uh, of that, of that great uh, of plain a complex. He encircled it with walls, built a, a self-sustaining community where he could be in a, in, a, in a really amazing palace on the very front of it. It looked like it was hanging off the cliff. And so he built Masada. Masada is still such an impressive place. It's one of the uh, of Israel's most cherished landmarks. Today, if the Israeli army, when they commission an officer in the Israeli army, they do all those commissioning services at Masada. They'll go out there and they line up. Military gets all up there. Jets buzz them. All that kind of stuff. It is an impressive uh, thing. But it was a natural thing that, must, that, that Herod built a palace on. He also built Herodium. Herodium was his palace right next to uh, uh, Bethlehem. And, and that, literally there, he built a mountain. There was not a mountain, and he decided to build a palace. He built a mountain. <laughs> I mean, it's still there. The mountain's still there, and a palace on top of that mountain. Here's the thing he did. Every time he built something, it was over the top. It was, it was functional. It kept him safe, but it was also uh, things that people would never say. He was, he was a great architect, a visionary of his time. But the most impressive thing he did... And the thing that made him the most money and made him the wealthiest man in the world at the time was he built a port in a city at a place called Caesarea. He wanted to build the temple so that, so that Israel would like him, but he wanted to build a Roman city in Israel so that Rome would like him. And he built a Roman city at Caesarea. It had a hippodrome, had an amphitheater, all the things that Roman people thought were important in a city. It was a true Roman city. But the biggest thing he built there was a port for the Mediterranean Sea. He sunk concrete around it and made uh, like a, a you know about a half mile of a, of a seawall that protected this amazing huge port so that ships could come in there and take refuge when the when the Mediterranean Sea was rough. Now here's what that changed about the whole world. Herod literally changed commerce of the whole Roman Empire by doing that because what was before before he built that port, uh, every ship that went between Rome and Egypt had to navigate and had to make a long journey. A lot of times in winter when wheat came in, it was winter time, and they lost a lot of crops. They lost a lot of ships because not every ship would make that journey from Rome to Egypt or Egypt to Rome. But when, when Herod built his port, guess what? They had a place they could come halfway. And so they'd make half the journey, wait out the winter, and then they didn't lose ships. But guess what Herod got? He got a cut. <laughs> he got a cut, buddy, of every shipment between Rome and Egypt. Can you imagine? I mean, he was loaded. All kinds of money. Riches, riches. But let me tell you something. Even with all that money, we went with all the grandeur of everything that Herod built. Listen, this simple little baby. This little baby born to a poor carpenter from Nazareth don't even have enough money to be able to rent a room. Comes into the world in poverty. Listen to me. The poverty of Jesus was richer than the wealth that Herod had. Richest man in the world. Yet he had nothing that Jesus had. You know what the Bible says about the poverty of Jesus? Listen to this. I love this. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, how was he rich? He had all of heaven. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now look, 
Herod spent his whole time with earthly wisdom, trying to build earthly wealth, and you know what? Ended in nothing. Jesus comes into this world, what most people would think is foolishness. Comes into poverty and establishes his kingdom for everybody forever and ever. That's a contrast of kingdoms. But here's my favorite thing. Here's the, here's the thing I think is the coolest thing. I like the wisdom, like the poverty, but listen to this. I think this is so encouraging at Christmas time. The weakness of Jesus. Now listen to this. The weakness of Jesus is stronger than the power of Herod. The weakness of Jesus is stronger than the power of Herod. Here's the good news of Matthew's Christmas story. Herod, in all of his power, could not stop weak little Jesus. Amen? Man, that's good news. That is good news. And that is the story. You know how you try to find the headline? You know how you try to find where the real story? The real story is, is that little baby Jesus is stronger than powerful old Herod. You need to know, power, Herod was powerful. He, he established his kingdom on cunning and brute force. And listen, he didn't play. When they, when they first made him the governor of, uh, of, uh, of Israel, when uh, Roman Senate let him do that, he came in, he knew that his biggest opposition was going to be from the Sanhedrin. He knew that his biggest opposition were going to be from the religious leaders. So you know what the first thing he did when he came into Jerusalem as the king of Israel? What's to do? He killed 45 members of the Sanhedrin. 45 religious leaders in one day. Killed them. He, listen, he didn't play. He was showing everybody who was in charge. And his whole, his whole reign, Herod's kingdom was built on violence. Listen, he killed his own wife, Miriam, the Hasmonean princess. He got into a point where he didn't trust her anymore. He thought that she cheated on him, thought that he was, she was conspiring against him. He had her executed. He, broke, he hated it. He loved her. He thought she was the most beautiful thing in the world. But he had her killed. He executed her two sons, their two sons, Aristobulus and Alexander. He gave orders from his deathbed for the execution of his other son, Antipater. I mean, he, was, he, was, he died six days before he died. He, he got all jealous and, and worried and paranoid and thought that his son, Antipater, was, was conspiring against him and gave orders to have him killed. He was supposed to be the next king. Had him killed from his deathbed. You know, just to show you the cruelty and the viciousness of Herod, Herod is on his deathbed and he executed an order. He told him, he said, I want you to go round up all the leading men of Israel, all the elite, the powerful people of Israel, the richest people, the most powerful people of Israel. I want you to take them to my hippodrome in Caesarea. And that order was executed. They did that. They rounded them all up, took them to the hippodrome. And then he said, now listen, on the day that I die, I want you to execute all those men, all the leading men of Israel. He, you know why he wanted him to do that? He said, because I want there to be some real heartfelt mourning on my death. That's Herod. You see, that's why, you know, listen, the fact that he had the, these, these children killed in Bethlehem didn't even make the news for Herod. I mean, it wasn't that big a deal for him to do that. He was, he was powerful, and everybody was afraid of him all the time because he had absolute power over everybody's life. He was, a, he was a, a tyrant for his time, the king of Israel when Jesus was born. But now notice this. Jesus comes into the world. How does he come? He doesn't come as a Herod. He doesn't come as a Roman emperor. He comes as a weak little baby. Unprotected, poor, weak little baby. At the mercy of a great king like Herod. Herod plots. Herod tries to stop him. Herod tries to find him. But guess what? All the power of Herod falls short in stopping Jesus. Amen? How many of you know that the weakness of God is stronger than the power of men? Praise God. Listen, that is the good news of Christmas. <laughs> that is the good news of Christmas. It's not just about a cute little baby being born that gives us some cool cards so that we can have an opportunity to give gifts to each other. You know what the true meaning of Christmas is? The true meaning of Christmas is that the King of kings and the Lord of lords has been born and He is establishing His kingdom and nobody can stop it. Not even King Herod. Amen? Kingdoms are in conflict, but listen to me. If you're 
following Jesus, you're on the winning side. Amen? That's the message of Christmas this morning. Well, listen, you need to give your heart to the King. Here's my question for you this holiday season. Are you, like Herod, using all your wisdom, using all your wealth, using all the power? You may not have as much as Herod had, but you've got what you've got. Are you living your life for you, building your own kingdom like Herod built his kingdom? Or have you given your life to Christ? Are you seeking to serve Him? Is He your King? You're either going to be your own King or you're going to let Jesus be your King. And that's the question this Christmas I want to challenge you with. Listen, Jesus didn't just come into the world to come into the world. Jesus came into the world so that He could come into your world. He wants to come into your house. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to be the King of Kings. He's going to be the King of Kings. Listen, nobody's going to stop Him. He's going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The question this morning is, is He your King? Is He the King of your heart? Would you let Him be that today? Well, if you'll stand with us here in just a moment, I'm going to pray for us. Brother Ken's going to come and lead us. Let's all stand together. And if you're here today, you've never given your heart to Christ. You've never received His salvation. You, the Savior King is not sitting on the throne of your heart. Listen, let today be the day of your salvation. He is a good King. I don't regret one time I've obeyed Him. He's nothing but good to us. Would you give your heart to Christ today? Let's pray together. Brother Ken, come and lead us in our time of worship. Lord, we love you today. God, we thank you so much for the great gift of our Savior King, the Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you that the kingdom of Herod could not stop the kingdom of Jesus. God, thank you today that the kingdom of Jesus is the strongest force in this world. Lord, help us in Jesus' name to submit to Him. Help us to surrender to Him. Help us to walk with Him. Help us to follow Him. Help us to receive Him. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never given their heart to Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would convict them of their sin right now. Show them their need for you. Give them faith to believe. Help them to turn to you. And let this Christmas be a time of salvation for them. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all that you're doing. I pray that you have your hand on this invitation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.